So apparently there's some game today. <laughs> I don't know if any of you heard about it. Um, <clears throat> um, I have to say that the only sports that were watched with any regularity in my home was the Olympics. Um, and my ambivalence to sports hasn't really changed since then. Um, but you know, after the, in the last several years, uh, we've lived in Kansas City. And both the football team, the Chiefs, and the baseball team, the Royals, have done some pretty great things um, in the last couple of years. And there's been a lot of excitement about it. And, um, you know, in the, when the Royals made the World Series uh, in 2014, there was lots of excitement. Everybody was, you know, people were getting on board. Everywhere you looked, there was blue, which is their color. Uh, and in 2015, like it was right after we left Kansas City, they actually won the World Series. Schools were closed on the day of the parade and the um, celebration rally because they, well, partly because the schools figured too many teachers would call in sick and they didn't <laughs> keep the schools open. Um, but they had 800,000 people estimated show up for this rally. 800,000 people, right? That's eight with a lot of zeros after it, <laughs> five zeros. Um, almost a million, and there were uh, no violence, no troubles, no whatever. The whole city came together in, in this big thing. So that's pretty cool, even if it, you know, I'm like, well, it wouldn't be great if they all came together about, I don't know, peace or something, but whatever. Um, anyway. As a sports outsider, I have found this whole phenomenon around sports to be very curious. And as a minister, of course, I wonder, hmm, what's that about? Because that's what I do as a minister. So what makes people get so excited and emotionally involved in a game that honestly, most of us have absolutely no impact in the outcome of it? I mean, I don't care if you wear your special socks or you turn your rally cap inside out or whatever. You really have nothing to do with what's going to happen in the game. Let's be honest. Um, and a friend of mine, who she's lived in Kansas City her whole life, never been a super big sports fan. Even she got caught up in the whole thing. And she said for her, it was part of being, it was like her town was finally kind of making it on the scene. You know, Kansas City has kind of got a bad rap. It was part of the flyover area of the country and it was finally shown up on a scene as, as having something worth stopping for um and you know i think that the the seahawks the 12th man phenomenon thing that they have going on is part of it too because people do feel genuinely engaged and belonging to something bigger than themselves hmm. now i don't call issue with a sports fan because it wouldn't get me anywhere um, and the gatherings, big and small, of people coming together today to cheer over or lament over a bunch of guys chasing the ball around. Or there's also gatherings that focus on the expensive commercials that are interrupted with a bunch of guys chasing the ball around. <laughs> there is plenty of social pressure to know what's going on and to feel part of something that's a powerful force. People want to be a part of something. <coughs> but you know I'm not leaving it at all that. I would have said all that if I was. So today we celebrated our new members. And these folks have be, said yes to being part of something too. These folks have claimed this community as theirs. Not their only community, but one of their communities. Just as a sports camp fan claims a team. Well, some of you are members and some of you have not formally embraced membership. We're all part of this team this spiritual community. And that was awesome. Yay, we're choosing a team. We're choosing team unity. Um, unlike a sports team, is that our, our team plays all year. And every everybody here actually does play a part. And we always win. <laughs> now, none of you are here because you accidentally wandered in while walking down 68th Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Cheryl took a couple weeks to find us the first time she tried to find us. Um, well, I might, it might be very interesting to listen to. I might be interesting to listen to. It's not just most me that most of you came here for either. It's to be part of something. A group that cares, that supports one another, 
that wants to make the spiritual take the experience, spiritual experience deeper. And that's we're here to be each other's fans. Yay! To cheer each other in the good times, to lend a hand or a hug when things aren't going so well, to pray and pray up your life which is the book we're loosely following right now. I'm jumping all over to the different parts of it. In um, chapter 16, or sorry, it says 28. Wow. Okay. In chapter 28, she writes, A spiritual community is the place where we f expect to find others who have made it their intention to live a life centered in spiritual ideals. That's why we come. You see, I believe that we are all looking for belonging, for connection, a place to be understood. Social scientist and researcher Brene Brown brings us, she has actual data, like research, this is what she does. Uh, that, and this data shows that being vulnerable is one of the key parts to having an authentic life. Now, when we feel the need to hide our true selves, we can't grow, overcome, or connect fully with others in the world around us. Certainly, it can be scary to share the deep, dark secrets of, of your life, or just to plop them out there on the table. But we are growing every day. We are growing this foundation for more authentic connections, which might happen over coffee or in class, or in meditation, or with a prayer partner. Now, I've been very blessed to have such a wonderful support community, spiritual community woven into my life. When I was a kid, I attended Unity Camp for kids, and I met Unity kids from other churches. Some of these people I still am connected with through the wonders of Facebook and other things. Um, and I met these kids from other churches around the region, and there were also leaders that were teens, and we looked up to them and thought they were amazing. We wanted to be like them. As a teen, I met Unity teens from around the country, and I'm still connected to some of these folks as well. And then I moved to Unity Village, and I got another amazing spiritual community. I met students and leaders and, and new friends, and um, just like Linda, who wrote um, a song. And I can honestly say I've made it to where I am because of the persistence of my community to love me through the hard times, remind me to choose the compassion as a response because sometimes we all need to be reminded, and to remind me of who I am when I start to forget. I believe we're here to journey together. That's what we're here for. There's times when we need someone to lean on, and I believe it's just as important for us to take the role of the leaned on as well. Um, one of my friends, I had this great analogy, you know, she was going through a rough time, and, and of course we've both done this for another. I said, you know, it's just like when you're on a boat, and sometimes one of your friends, you know, it's like everything's all cattywampus and you're being in a storm all over the place, and I'll just be here and be the mast you can hold on to as the boat rocks all over the place. And then another time, we'll switch places, and you can be the mast I can hold on to during the during the storm. And and that's you know what a spiritual community is about. Um, so in the forty seventh prayer practice in Pray Up Your Life, which is thank God for friends, um, we are reminded of the story from Job. Job um, started with a really excellent life. Things were going really good. But then he lost his property, his home, his children, and then he was physically disfigured and his health was going down the, the tubes. And so we pick up the story in Job 2.11. And it goes, Now when Job's three friends heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. They met together to go and console and com comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. What great gift is that? They sat with him because he felt so bad. The 
the gift of presence. Now you may have family or friends who are good, who are good as, as Job's friends were at this practice of presence. And in this community, we're here for you as well, for each other. And we are consciously creating this community here at Unity and in our personal lives all the time. All our choices are leading to either creating a more or less of this supporting and creative and caring environment. That we need this environment to thrive and we're always making the choices. That it's either getting us the more there or not as much. Um, of course, I am optimistic and the big vision of holding where we can go as a community, that's my job, it's a pretty cool job. But I also know that as a vision, we come together as a community to create whatever it is we want as a community for our future. Now, the next thing that happened in Job's story is that he went on and on and on for quite some time about how awful his life was. And after his friends listened for a while, they gave him a talking to, get yourself together, forgive and seek understanding sort of talk which is also a good thing for your friends to do sometimes. Which he did eventually follow through on, and this is an important part of our community. But you know, those friends had to create the caring environment bubble to start with. Just as a host is getting ready for an upcoming game watch party, ensuring that the snacks and the seating and the decorations and everything is just right, we are every day creating the environment of our field of play. So how do we create a spiritual community here at Unity and beyond in our personal lives? Well, we take a page from Job's friends and we be present with one another. We release the stories we have about one another, whether they're real or made up. We consciously strive to see the person in front of us with eyes of love and understanding. And we choose to agree and disagree in love. Now, we have nine more months of the presidential election. And I don't know about you, but I'm already done with the mudslinging that I hear far and wide. Now, I know that we have people who are part of our community who are all over the political spectrum. And that's good because it's a spectrum. But here's the deal. It's way too easy when we feel strongly about something, about an issue or a candidate, to decide that whoever's on the other side of it is wrong, stupid, etc. But here's the thing. It's just not that clear cut. Most of us have, in our day-to-day -day lives, we know that most of life lives in the gray place in between extremes. And so each of us has bully reasons to believe what we do. They're good reasons. And while I'm usually about civil discourse, I'm declaring our church a neutral zone. Neutral zone, walk in the door, no buttons, no t we're not talking, we're not doing it. Nope. Mm -mm. <laughs> because the hour or two or more that we spend here each week is a time away from the day-to-day -day world. It's a time to focus on our spiritual journey and walking with one another. And while I heartily encourage you to support your causes and get involved and learn more about the issues and be engaged, I also heartily encourage you to pause, to pray, to contemplate and find deep within you where and on what you are truly being called to spend your energies. In nine months and one day, we will arrive at election day. And after that, we'll have a new commander in chief. And whether it's your candidate or not, we will need to move forward as one team, making our lives and our worlds better with every action. So here on Team Unity, we're a team of love, of kindness, compassion, supporting each other on our spiritual journey. And when we're here, that's the team we're on, and that's the only team that we need to worry about. The spiritual journey is not one of a destination. It's like a super, like a super Bowl ring, but one, wait, sorry, whoo, 
The spiritual journey is not one of a destination, but like a Super Bowl ring, that's a destination, but one of daily practice as an athlete prepares for the big game. Every time we engage in prayer and meditation, spiritual study, choosing kindness for others and for ourselves, we are becoming more and more of the enlightened ones we're here to express. So today the crowds will cheer on and there will be celebration and there will be tears. The sports cycles will continue to roll by and whether we pay attention or not, our lives will also roll by and each day we are creating the field of play for the Super Bowl of our lives. So we can do it. Game on! <laughs>